So, uh, you know, when anyone comes to speak about AI injustice, uh, there is a tendency to talk about AI in terms of robot judges, right? What's going to happen if AI starts taking decisions for us? If uh, your court case is determined by an AI application? And I think that this perspective is critical because uh, we already know that there are huge issues around bias and opacity around, uh, where it comes to AI taking decisions. But the problem is that sometimes this perspective that if AI was to take decisions, this would happen, these negative consequences would happen, you know, hides the real possibility of AI injustice. Uh, it hides the fact that the applications of AI injustice are not one application alone. It's not just about taking decisions. There are countless applications in justice, which is an area where the gap between what citizens get and what they need is absolutely massive. Sometimes we use the term gap, but I don't know how many of you know that uh, the truth of the matter is only one in 10 people who have a justice problem come to the formal system. So all the counting of the problems in the formal system begin after that one in nine out of 10 have opted out of it. So uh, the gap is actually just a gigantic gap and uh, sometimes when the conversation is just about the bias of AI in taking decisions, we don't see these opportunities. We don't see that AI could help find a case, find the right case, answer a legal query, make a process smarter, make a document for you, check a document for you, in addition to helping take a decision. Not taking a decision, but helping take a decision. That is what lies ahead. And for a country that uh, you know, is 1.4 billion people, 122 languages, where one out of 10 people are taking recourse to formal systems, we need not a handful, we need thousands of solutions that are driven by technology. I want to talk a little bit about uh, what it will take to create those thousands of solutions. Because it's not going to be one great solution alone. We need solutions from civil society. We need solutions from the private sector. We need industry-led solutions. We need governmental solutions. We need all these solutions touching different aspects of the whole access to justice problem as we know it. And that's not going to happen if we're going to depend on a few deep pocket-led AI creations. There'll always be, as is in every country, a few startups using AI to provide solutions. But that is not alone for a country like ours. We need a very strong foundation in open, collaborative, free AI for justice. Right? We need technologies that are available for anyone to build on. If we don't have that middle layer, we can sometimes get distracted by really cool applications that somebody has made, but we don't have that middle layer on which everyone can build. Then what happens is over a period of time, a new innovator finds it almost impossible to build something because that middle layer of open, collaborative, and free AI has not been built. Let me give you a small example. Today, every single person uses computer vision, right? Today, our computers are so good at recognizing images, aside from telling you mistakenly that that person in your Google Photos is your wife and is not actually your wife. I mean, all that stuff still happens, but it does that. It does it with tremendous accuracy. And almost all of computer vision was born from the ImageNet project that Professor Fei-Fei Li and a few people built as a public good for people to use. So you need those open foundations, and, simply, and we need AI models that understand legal language. Now, anyone here familiar with legal language knows that that is a feat, right? You need to train the model, you need to train technology, not just to understand a simple statement like, I went to the lake to fill a bucket of water, you need them to train, you need to train the technology to understand what the judge said or what the lawyer said. And I want to share with you a little example of that. You know, uh, this is a, a judge actually talking about the convoluted language in a statute. And the judge says, 
To reach a conclusion on this matter involved the court in wading through a monstrous legislative morass, staggering from stone to stone and ignoring the marsh gas exhaling from the forest of schedules lining the way on each side. I regarded it at one time, I must confess, as a slow of despond through which the court would never drag its feet. But I have, by leaping from tussock to tussock as best as I might, eventually, pale and exhausted, reached the other side. Now, we think this is British judges, but it's not true. We have our own floral Indian judges, and we have our own floral Indian language, and to train AI to understand Indian forms, Indian regulations, Indian acts, is not a small feat. But if without those models, that AI that can understand Indian legal language, you're not going to get here. You're not going to get to technology that finds the case really smartly, answers a legal query, not for a lawyer, for anyone. Somebody saying, am I entitled to this government scheme? I have this document. Is my property secure? Whatever that is, we're not going to get there unless we build the free and open AI foundation not by one company, but as a collective societal act to build that foundation. One such initiative I want to talk about is Open Nyai. Open Nyai is a collaboration between several of the leading national law universities, professors from the IITs, and most importantly, hundreds of law students to develop the data to train AI models that can understand Indian legal language. And this is students sitting down and telling the computer, telling the machine, this, by the way, is a fact in the judgment. Oh, this is a point of law in the judgment because a technologist alone can't do it and a lawyer can't do it. The technologist doesn't know that that is an obiter, which is a, a, a discussion in a case that is not pertaining to the central point of law. Or that is a ratio, or that is an argument. It's impossible for a technologist to know that if they're not working hand in hand with a lawyer who unfortunately doesn't know how to train machines to develop that capability. So both have to work together. And we've seen countless examples where this doesn't happen enough unless a social endeavor is undertaken to bring those communities together. And that's what OpenAI is trying to do. I want to share with you all a small example that I, I love uh, giving about the power of collaborative digital public good creation. So just bear with me on this. Could you just show that little video, please? At the highest volume possible. Many ek saal yaha Delhi me ek karkhane me kam kia hai, aur mera malik paise nahi de raha hai. It's processing. আমি দিল্লিতে একটি কারখানা ঝো এক বছর কাজ করেছি এবং আমার মালিক টাকা দিচ্ছেন না so for those of you who are not familiar with indian languages you might struggle with that but what you're hearing there is a real time voice to voice translation from any indian language to any other indian language that that is not a part of this that must be a youtube ad <laughs> sorry about that but what you heard was totally remarkable because it wasn't your typical Google text translate, right? What happened there was I spoke in, I selected an Indian language, I spoke in it. In real time, it picked an AI model that could translate that to any other destination Indian language that I wanted. And I remember playing this video at a conference of young Adivasi tribal leaders. And I remember the young Adivasis, uh, four young Adivasis standing up in front and saying, we're from the Gond community. How do we train the machine to understand Gond? Because in India, people don't read as much as they listen. So if you can build translation models, voice-to-voice -voice translation, and that is completely a collaborative endeavor that has been done by technologists, the government, students all working together. So in India, we can show a totally different model to build AI to the world, a cost-effective, highly collaborative model that by virtue of being collaborative has less bias in it. By virtue of being open has more options, so you reduce the dependency problem in a critical area like law and justice. Uh, thank you all, and uh, please do keep following this initiative of, uh, of our community. It's called Open Nyai. Pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. <laughs>